How's that for a slice of fried gold? Oh, you think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. I'll be back. Just a fresh wound. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. I'm sorry, Ben. I'm afraid I can't do that. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I guess everyone's a title one good scare. You guys like helicopters? Yeah, they're all right. They're all right. I mean, every now and then, uh, I think because my office is so close to the law enforcement center downtown, uh, every now and then get one or one or two flying over. It's always more just, I mean, and because we're in an old house, it just shakes the whole damn building. Well, you are going to really sympathize with Mr. Dan O'Bannon on this episode. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I remember the Return of the Living Dead zombie from our Romero uh, series. Or no, that well, yeah, it was the zombie. He stands up and gets all chopped up, remember, in the helicopter blade? Oh, not, yeah. return, not Return, it's a Dawn Yeah, that was dead. in Dawn. Yeah, we haven't talked about Return yet. Well, sorry, I, I meant That's... to say Dawn. <laughs> Dawn. So, that, so what's your point, that that guy probably doesn't like helicopters? Uh, that zombie doesn't, yeah, that zombie's not thinking about much these days. Start the show, Gary. All right. Well, hello and welcome to Cinema Shock. It is a podcast that's dedicated to the history and evolution of cult and genre movies. I am one of your hosts, Gary Horn. I am another host, Justin Bishop. I'm trying to match Gary's energy. Yeah, there you go. And we're in, to my left here is writer, comedian, former police officer. I don't know why I decided to throw that in there. It's true. I guess <laughs> <laughs> because we're talking about a movie about cops. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Mr. Todd A. Davis. Hey, everybody. Thanks okay. for having me on the show. Too- <laughs> I love it. That's Bringing Todd, the energy. Is no longer, Todd, Todd is no longer a police officer. Let's yep. specify that. Re- retired. Retired forever. Yes, yes. Retired forever. <laughs> I can't do that shit anymore. <laughs> yeah. I Way to kill the conversation. When I was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just looking at Gary, like just messing with his arm over here. Well, my arm itched. I was so scratching. I felt like I had a, a, a spot on my arm. An exciting, immersive <laughs> audio experience for everyone. <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome everyone to part something of our Dan O'Bannon series. I have lost track of where we're at, but we're almost done with the career of Dan O'Bannon, but we're not quite Thank there God. yet. We've got to, no, this has been fun. This has been a fun <laughs> series. Yeah, this has been and a good one. His, his career is just, I don't know, it's very intriguing to me mm-hmm. because it just never took off, really. But he made at least, he made some really good movies. He yeah. made some real, I mean, obviously Alien's amazing, and the movie we're talking about next week is one of my favorites. The one we're talking about this week, though, first time Justin I've ever hates. seen it. Nope. Uh, I liked it, but this is the first time I've ever seen it. So I had no real history with it. This is the only movie we've talked about on this series that I just had no history with at all. So it was kind of a fun one to to really dive into, I think, and a surprising amount of information out there about this one. So for our next stop on our journey through Dan O'Bannon's career, we're going to once again meet a bit of turbulence. And I did not mean to make a flying reference right then, <laughs> but that's maybe I said, maybe it was subconscious. But at this point in his career, Alien was still the closest thing to O'Bannon's vision that had ever made made uh, it to the big screen with one big caveat. And we've mentioned this multiple times because it's a big deal, I think, in O'Bannon's career is that the screenplay was rewritten prior to filming. And his next big budget outing would come two years later in the form of an action film about a high tech police helicopter set in Los Angeles a film that O'Bannon would later, in typical Dan O'Bannon fashion, pretty much disown in that film. And the subject of this week's episode is John Badham's Badham? 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 Badham. 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 Badham is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, let's go Badham. <laughs> uh, the, it's a movie called Blue Thunder. Roy Scheider is Frank Murphy, a lone wolf. Free! Who's about to become a guinea pig. I thought it was illegal to arm police helicopters. Well, that would depend on the circumstances, wouldn't it? 
Columbia Pictures presents Blue Thunder, a flying arsenal that hears through walls, sees in the dark, and thinks your thoughts. Wherever you look, the guns follow. It was designed for war-torn countries. One civilian dead for every ten terrorists. That's an acceptable ratio, unless you're one of the civilians. It was assigned to American cities. You talking about crowd control from the air? And that's what this special detail is all about. They told Murphy to test it. They didn't tell him what it was for. A dozen of these coppers and you can run the whole damn country. Who was behind it? Where are we? Federal building. Really? Hey, you want to find out what's going on in there? I certainly do. But when Murphy went looking for answers... You got all this on tape? I got every word of it. If it gets back to me, I'll deny it. The answer... Uh-oh, uh-oh. ...came looking for him. They had the ultimate weapon and the perfect plan. But Murphy stole their thunder. Bad Ham is a rival company to J.J. Uh, Abrams' Bad Robot. Oh, <laughs> well, robots would sense. win, and if there was a fight. Well, it depends on how much ham there is. <laughs> how do you think they fed toddlers before there were helicopters and airplanes? Oh, you know, man. just before you That's could make true. those noises. Like, Does anyone oh, do the helicopter? It was always airplanes. You know, I used to have a barber when I was a kid that would always say, do you want a helicopter or the airplane today? As though his shears, those... I guess, made different noises, but they didn't know. Looking back, I'm like, he was just fucking with me the whole time. Like he was just like, <laughs> Wait, that was like the I don't care. Of... It's going to sound like me turning on my shears. <laughs> that was just the sound of his, <laughs> of his shears. Yeah. That he was referring to. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He would just, no, the barber was feeding me. I don't think that gentleman has ever heard an airplane or a helicopter before. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> anyway, so, that's a good story. This uh, this is this episode starting off weird. A lot of <laughs> a lot of weird conversation we're having going into Blue Thunder. <laughs> well, let's just talk about the movie then. So Dan O'Bannon began writing the screenplay for Blue Thunder in the late 1970s with a guy named Don Jacoby, another screenwriter who he was living with at the time. And this was around the time just after Alien had come out. And O'Bannon and Jacoby had discussed working on a spec script together. And the idea was that Jacoby was going to do most of the writing with O'Bannon's name listed first on the screenplay for what O'Bannon calls practical reasons, which basically means because they knew that because of the success of Alien, that having O'Bannon's name on there first would help the screenplay sell. This is the story of Dan O'Bannon's life. Like everybody really just wants to use is. that alien screen cred. Yeah, he's hey, he's making a career out of it. Uh, and there wasn't really an idea for the script at the time. They're just like, hey, let's write something together. And it, it wouldn't take very long before an idea came along. And like so much with O'Bannon's career, the idea for the script was the result of him just being angry. So they lived in Hollywood at the time, him and Jacoby. And they couldn't sleep at night because these police helicopters would constantly fly around overhead around their apartment and they would like hit their house with searchlights and it was just really annoying. It was really irritating. So one night when this is happening, Dan O'Bannon just turns to Jacoby and he says, we should make a movie about this. So that's a pretty broad idea for a screenplay. How do you make a compelling story about helicopters constantly flying overhead? Well, if you're Dan O'Bannon, you use those helicopters as a symbol for government intrusion into our private lives. Here's what Dan O'Bannon had to say about it. This is from an interview in Starlog magazine in 1983 to coincide with the, uh, with the release of the film. He says, quote, helicopters per se, I like. I don't particularly like them going back and forth over the sky watching us and everything. The police have those things up there because they can prevent crime. They're very handy. The trouble is that the police don't particularly care if they drive the rest of the population crazy or violate the rights of everyone else in order to catch a criminal. They don't care about preventing crime. They care about catching criminals. And towards that end, they will do anything to the rest of the citizenry. They don't care. That's what this picture is about. That's a pretty big concept for uh, yeah. for a, a, a movie that for an idea that spawned from just being annoyed by a helicopter yeah uh, the idea of government <laughs> you know intruding into your private lives which is very much what this movie is about especially right. what it originally started as yeah. uh 
And he's not wrong. He's well, not, no. I mean, but also at this point, I feel less sorry for Dan O'Bannon. I'm like, listen, O'Bannon, you're coming in here with all these lofty goals for your screenplay. And you know, the second you pass that off to somebody, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the um, privacy laws and stuff. Anyway, you got a helicopter? What kind of cool shit does the helicopter do? <laughs> does it blow things up? Does it turn into a robot or something? It does not do that. I bet that was passed around. I bet that was a production note. The original script to Blue Thunder was uh, vastly different from the film that would eventually end up on screen. It was definitely more overtly political, attacking the concept of a police state controlling the population through high-tech surveillance and intimidation. And while writing the script, they actually uh, consulted with and received a lot of help from a guy named Bob Woods. He was a captain. He was uh, the, the chief of the Los Angeles Air Support Division. And they were very supportive. That Nobody really paid much attention to the air support division. So they, I think they were happy to get some recognition, but they couldn't use that name uh, for reasons that will become obvious in, in the film. But the first draft of the screenplay was written in 1979. So like this is right as Aliens coming out. And its main character, Frank Murphy, was written as less of a hero and more of a total maniac with deep psychological issues who goes on a rampage destroying much of Los Angeles before being blown to bits by F-16s. So he's not quite the guy that we get in this film. Listen, we, we've, been, we've been on this O'Bannon series for, what, a month and a half or something now? Yeah. We've all gotten to know O'Bannon pretty well, I think, as well as we can through just, you know, knowing the guy through interviews and things like that. So it might be stating the obvious to say that O'Bannon was less than pleased about the changes that were made to his script. This guy does not like people messing with, I mean, he knows that scripts are going to be rewritten. That's just the nature of the beast in Hollywood, but he was not happy with how this particular one was restructured. Hmm. And he's working here with, with Jacoby, who is also a, uh, pretty solid in his own right i mean the guy i mean he does a bunch of stuff with dan o'bannon i think they do uh, uh like invaders from mars and life force together after this yeah. but um jacoby does like the philadelphia experiment and uh arachnophobia and like one of the death wish movies and or some i think he did the screenplay for john carpenter's vampires and yeah. stuff like that so he's uh so he's he's a pretty well-established screenwriter or not at this point well, but not, will at be. this time he had not i don't think at this time he had had anything produced this yeah this is the beginning of his career here but yes he goes on to uh to do quite a lot of pretty pretty good films i mean john carpenter's vampires notwithstanding don't start <laughs> <laughs> uh but one of the many people that o'bannon has beef with about this particular movie probably the guy he's got the biggest beef with about this particular movie is the man who directed this film john bad badham beef <laughs> John Badham. Badham is a director who, like many directors, especially at this time, got his start in television before having a major breakthrough with his second film, which was 1977's Saturday Night Fever. Hey, yo. Have you, you guys seen Saturday Night Fever? Oh, man. It's, it's, it's a movie a while, that a lot of people but... know about but haven't actually seen, I feel like. I feel I, I fall into that camp. Yeah. It's uh, people know it because of the Bee Gees and all that shit. And they, you think right. it's just, like this big, like lighthearted romp? It's not. It's fucking dark. It's a fucking dark, <laughs> depressing movie. It really is. Like, I'm not exaggerating. It, it's if you only know it from like it being like a disco movie or whatever, it is. It goes to some pretty dark places. It's actually very, very good. It's a very good movie. Nice. Uh, I would recommend checking it out if you haven't seen it. But so Batum followed that film up with 1979's Dracula. He wanted to change a pace. So he goes over to England, does Dracula with Frank Langella in the title role. And then his next film is going to be blue thunder. He was actually working on Dracula when he had the, the blue thunder offer given to him. Yo, he's also the brother of a uh, uh, scout from to kill a mockingbird. What? Really? Like yeah. the, from the movie? Huh? Well, not from the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Her is uh, Mary Batum plays scout. And uh, this okay. Is, this is her. This is her brother. Just throw that wow, out that's, there. That's, just, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know yeah. that. Uh, uh, cool. His later credits. Uh, this guy had a pretty cool career. Like his later credits included the Matthew Broderick film War Games. It actually came out the same year as Blue Thunder. Later on in the year, uh, Short Circuit, which we oh, all yeah. loved when we were kids. I mean, uh, Johnny Five. Our age, Johnny Five. Uh, Point of No Return, which is like the Lafem Nikita remake, uh, and then the classic Wesley Snipes action film Drop Zone. You guys remember Drop Zone? Uh, 
Yeah. I don't. He did like honestly. he did stakeout. You don't remember Drop Zone? I don't know. I was a big Wesley Snipes fan when I was like a teenager because um well mostly because of Demolition Man and then Passenger 57 and Drop Zone came around around that time. It involved skydiving. Wait, I just pulled it up and I definitely remember that poster. So I'm sure I would it would start to come together for me as I went through it. Gary Busey, of course, is in there. I mean, so. I haven't seen it since 1995 or 96 probably right not long after it came out but i remember liking it then yancy butler too whatever happened to her where's she at i gotta find her she starts gary, off gary's and... going down a... <laughs> no, going... No. let's talk about oh, drops on with wesley snipes <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh well is it and michael jeter's in it uh, oh yeah rest Look in peace all. i always he was always one of my favorite like character actors back then anyway we're getting off we're getting off subject <laughs> here <laughs> so after coming on as the director of blue thunder madam asked o'bannon and jacoby for some changes in the script that's normal and o'bannon says that they quote slavishly and obediently made those changes but it wasn't long before Batam brought in a screenwriter of his own a guy named dean riser and the way that Batam describes it is that Riser was basically brought in as essentially a, a script doctor, the same kind of job that O'Bannon had on Dead and Buried, only he happened to get a screenwriting credit on that, but script doctors usually don't. Uh, but Batam wanted Riser to flesh out some of the characters in the script, but what O'Bannon says Riser did was, quote, he came in and moved around the commas. <laughs> uh, uh, this, this, this Starlog interview with Dan O'Bannon from 1983 is a fucking delight because he is he just <laughs> comes across as the crankiest dude about what they did with his screenplay in this movie i'll tell you here's one thing about dan o'bannon he will speak his mind if you now if you watch him in later interviews like on the uh, there's a docu uh, documentary about the making of blue thunder that was on some of the uh, out of print dvd releases and he comes he's a little more political i guess where he's you know He's playing the politics and being a little nicer about it. But you read interviews from the time that it came out, and he was not not happy with with the movie. It's too bad. This is a pretty good movie. Yeah. Well, what, what concerned O'Bannon was that he felt like the rewrites took the teeth out of his script. So in, in the original script that he'd written, which you can find online, uh, the LAPD, the police, they were pretty much the bad guys of the piece. Uh, all of the bad stuff, all of the various outrages committed were done so by the cops. But when Batum and Columbia Pictures came in, they turned the police into heroes and then made these like federal agents, the federal government. They made them the villains. I felt like they did like a mix. Like when they find the tape, it's a tape of like federal agents and LAPD. Well, it's... Yeah, but I think by making Murphy more of like a hero is kind of what he's more referring to. Oh, uh, gotcha. You know, because he was not very sympathetic also in the original script. Uh, as O'Bannon says, quote, the idea of portraying the LAPD as blameless champions of individual liberty at odds with the federal government is strange. <laughs> and he's, he's not wrong. I mean, that is kind of, a, I mean, they would, they would 100% be working together on something like this. If, if this yeah. was the case. Oh yeah. So the cast for the film included Roy Scheider as the lead character of Frank Murphy. Uh, Scheider, we know this is a few years after, he had done Jaws and Sorcerer and in the French Connection. Like he was a big star at the time. And what attracted him to O'Bannon and Jacoby's script, the original one before the extensive rewrites, uh, was there, it was the political bent of the script. That's actually what attracted him to the project. That's what really spoke to him. All, although he wasn't very keen to do a helicopter movie at the time because he had just filmed William Friedkin's Sorcerer, which was filmed in the Dominican Republic, like, like out in the outskirts of the jungle. And he had to fly a helicopter 75 miles each day to reach the film's locations. Uh. So he was like, I'm tired of helicopters right now. I'm sick of helicopters. Yeah, yeah he eventually decided he had to get over the phobia because he did like the script so much. Like you said, I mean, uh, I had a quote from him from an article back then uh, with him saying, uh, the story supposes that some right thing or conservative group in the government decides that it will be a great idea for the crowd control in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles to use these helicopters for surveillance and to arm them, which is a pretty frightening idea. So that, I guess, kind of gives you some idea of like how the script might have been beforehand. Um, but he says, unfortunately, the other equipment they want to put aboard is equipment that can look 
through into your house, see anything that's alive and be able to record any conversation for five, 600 feet up in the air. The ship then becomes a representation of the total invasion of privacy, a flying big brother. In the film, the character I play, Murphy, a Los Angeles helicopter pilot, knows that this is a very evil and unnecessary thing, so he has to do something about it. That was uh, Roy uh, Schneider, Roy Shire, Scheider. God, Scheider. You, you screwed we're me gonna, up on this. We're going to keep lesson. doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, that's him explaining it. But uh, the, the, other, the other thing that happened to him at the time was apparently, you know, he had done Jaws, and so he's like well-known for Jaws. And he had been apparently cast in the deer hunter and really yeah and he dropped out of the deer hunter like he wanted to drop out of the deer hunter which he dis- disagreed with something and i cannot remember and knew you were gonna huh. freaking ask that um <laughs> but i mean part of me wants to feel like it i you know what i don't want to guess but anyway he uh he had he had been cast in it and he dropped out of it because he didn't think uh who who goes around the country or around the world looking for their friend that's what it was uh, Robert that, De Niro, maybe. Yeah, he said he didn't feel that character. It's been a few years since I've seen it. Same. So, uh, whoever that was, because he says he didn't feel like the character would do these certain things that they did, and he disagreed with it. So he tried to drop out of it, but he was under contract, so he had like a disagreement with them. But they agreed to let him out of the contract if he went ahead and did Jaws two, and so he mm. did Jaws two, and then he was like, he only did it out of you know he was hesitant, he wasn't a big fan. And then when Jaws 3 started being worked on, he said he knew there wasn't a snowballs or, but he says, uh, quote, Mestopheles couldn't talk me into doing this. They knew better than to ask. (laughs) But he said also, just in case, uh, he went ahead and signed on to another role with a rival company. So there was no way legally and physically, he was available to do Jaws 3. And so that's <laughs> so he did Blue Thunder, so, so he, he wouldn't have to do Jaws 3. So he did Blue Thunder. <laughs> wow. That's really great. I love that. I love that <laughs> reasoning. Uh, but his, his description of that original script, you can see how that's pretty different. I mean, yes, the idea of the, the, idea of the helicopter being an, an invasion of privacy is still in this, but his, the way his character reacts to it seems very different at first at least than in that original script because that first scene where you see him and and daniel stern in a helicopter this is before they're in blue thunder i think they're in a regular helicopter at this point they're already invading somebody's privacy they're watching that woman do naked yoga yeah uh yeah. so <laughs> so it, it, i feel like his character wouldn't have as big of a problem with the invasion of privacy because he's he's doing i mean he's indulging daniel stern's character really uh, it was his idea, but still, you know, he's very horny about all the things he can see from a helicopter. He, uh, Daniel Stern. Yeah. 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 He, uh, even when he like zooms in on that lady's boobies, he's like, Ooh, let me touch him. Like, it's very like, <laughs> <laughs> he is, he uh, is. He re- like, dude, have you never seen cleavage before? You're, you're like 25 years old. What? <laughs> it's, yes. There's uh, not even nipples. You're just looking at, at boobage. I have uh, the naked yoga scene. I have, never been so disgusted and interested in something in my life <laughs> <laughs> well we already mentioned daniel stern of course he plays the officer lyman good who's sort of uh frank murphy's partner in this uh, you've got candy clark as kate who had been in like american graffiti uh and then malcolm mcdowell as colonel cochran who is essentially the film's villain i mean i don't think malcolm mcdowell has ever played a character who's not a villain yeah <laughs> yeah there was like a conflict with the guy who was originally going to be in there it was the guy from fx that, that movie fx uh brian yeah. brown and uh he had some, something scheduling drop and so they brought in malcolm mcdowell last minute to do this convinced him to do it yeah they had to convince him because he was pretty reluctant to take the role because of the helicopters uh, but not for quite the same reasons as scheider mcdowell has an intense fear of flying scheider doesn't like helicopters or flying, or specifically helicopters. McDowell is incredibly terrified of flying. Wow. And, uh, but he read the script and he told, he's like, he told his agent, I can't do a movie where I have to fly in a helicopter the whole time. His agent assured him that they'd be shooting the flying scenes on a studio back lot. Uh, That was what he was contracted to do. But that is not quite what happened (laughs) because they ended up, 
he ended up coming to set and he keep, he's seeing that uh, Daniel Stern and Roy Scheider are they're getting in the helicopters and he was kind of embarrassed and didn't want to tell them that he didn't want to do it because he was because he was scared. So he ended up doing it anyway. One way to face your fears. Yeah, I mean, well, it it apparently did help with it. Uh, But he, I mean, like he was incredibly scared of flying. Like his wife at the time, which is Mary uh, Steenbergen, was his wife at the time. And she said that she couldn't even get him to like on a 747. So she's like, I don't know how the hell you guys are going to get him in a helicopter. Wow. And, uh, you know, they would do they would do scenes where he was flying and he would Roy Scheider tells it where, you know, they'd be watching the dailies and he's, he's acting while they're flying. And then immediately as they, when they yell cut, he puts his head like between his legs. Cause he just had to like, right. he was freaking out basically. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, huh. uh, but you'd never know it by watching the movie, honestly. No, it's a good actor. It's, it's, conv- <laughs> it's convincing. You know, yeah. He's a good actor. He's a, he's so, a cocky some bitch. Yeah. So, and then uh, rounding out the cast, the main cast is Captain Jack Braddock. And his final film role was a great character actor by the name of Warren Oates, who unfortunately passed away like two months after the movie finished filming. They were in post-production. The movie ends up being dedicated to him. Uh, Warren Oates is one of my favorite character actors of all time. He is incredible. He's got, he, he did a lot of like Sam Peckinpah movies back in the day, Bring Me the uh, Head of Alfredo Garcia, The Wild Bunch, stuff like that. Uh, he's in... Spielberg's duel you know he's he's a a really great character actor like and he is so much fun in this role I think he's just his line delivery is incredible I I was running this outfit when your idea of the big time was sitting in front of the boot tube watching Bugs Bunny gnawing on your fudge sickle (laughs) <laughs> it's so good it's so good it's it's, really, what's the other one he does uh there's that's, a that's a that's my favorite one though but yeah there's a moral to this story when you're walking on eggs don't hop <laughs> so he's got a I love he's him. got a buddy fetish with this quote I, <laughs> I just are you guys familiar with war notes like as an actor no. outside of this i'm really not super familiar with him but i did he was one of my favorite parts about this movie i, I mean if yeah, he's I mean, a character actor i bet he's been in half a dozen things i love Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure you, I imagine you, at least one of you guys have probably seen The Wild Bunch, at least. Yeah, you I've know. seen The Wild Bunch. Uh, yeah. But he's in, yeah, he's in that. It's in, Stripes. In, I think he's in Stripes. He's in well. Stripes. Yeah, he plays the uh, okay. a, a sergeant in there. Uh, yeah, he is just, he's really, really good. And he's just one of those character actors who he kind of always brings his own charisma to the role. It's always sort of, he's still sort of always wore notes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but oh, he, he was in uh, a movie I've been actually wanting to rewatch is one called Tulane Blacktop, which co-stars Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys and James Taylor. It's a it's a road trip movie, a car movie, uh, but it was directed by Monty Hellman, who passed away this this week. And it's a really great movie. It's got a really great Criterion Blu-ray. Uh, but War Notes uh, he plays a character named GTO in that, and that's an outstanding movie. Would highly nice. recommend that one. You're supposed to be dumb, son. Don't abuse the privilege. <laughs> Kat Every actually line. suggested. She actually suggested that when you're walking on eggs, don't hop, be a a catchphrase replacement for me. Anything's better than what you could <laughs> <say>. <laughs> and, I, and I said, really, and she said, Nah, never mind. <laughs> she goes, yes, leave it, Johnny's the case. <laughs> that's a okay. better. That's a better. At least it's a form of. It's a. It's a. It's motivational a a word to the masses yeah Yeah. a word to the wise anyway (laughs) the editor of this film frank morris he he played uh the f-16 fighter pilot i just thought that was interesting because they had like crew guys in here a lot like the director really john batham is like the tv news director it's his watch that roy scheider's apparently john batham's arm and stuff like when oh really so yeah, see him the like him looking at the watch and the countdown and stuff like that. Another interesting casting thing I thought was this guy Mario Machado, who plays the TV news anchor, and he is mm-hmm. like the TV news anchor of '80s cinema because yep. he is in like <laughs> every RoboCop movie as a TV news anchor. He's in Scarface as a TV news anchor in Rocky three. He was on like Murder She Wrote as a TV news anchor. Like he is just always a TV That's news just anchor. His thing. But he was an actual news anchor. Oh, was he? Was he an actual? I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I guess that makes sense. Well, and I only know that because I noticed when I was looking at the credits on this is that he is credited as himself. 
Oh, it says gotcha. Mario Machado himself. And so I was like, who is, is I, don't, I don't know that name. Who's oh, you're right. Who, As who I'm looking it? at it here, it does say Mario Machado. Yeah, Mario so I Machado. looked him up, and yep. yes, he, he has played a lot of news anchors, but it's because he actually was a news anchor. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, another thing that's important to mention for this film, I think, just to give it some credit, since there's not a lot of CGI, uh, some of the, I mean, the stunts are fantastic in this movie. Oh, yeah, they uh, are. So there's guys like uh, there's a Calvin Brown who's in like a lot of smaller acting roles throughout his career and did a lot of stunt work on a bunch of different movies. There's uh, Terry Leonard, who's an uncredited stunt coordinator on this movie, but he's a guy who's like still working right now and had been working like he started out doing i mean he was in like blazing saddles and apocalypse now cobra all in this same year he was doing what was it oh romancing the stone gremlins red dawn and starman and he's still like i said he's still around he did he was like stunt coordinator on death proof and multiple fast and furious movies the born movies like he's all over the place and the other guy i wanted to bring up is monty jordan he was the stunt, he's the official stunt coordinator of this movie. And he's been working since back on like True Grit with John Wayne. He was a stunt driver for the show SWAT. Um, he was the assistant stunt coordinator in Alien. If you had a movie in the 80s that needed stunts, this guy was probably somewhere around there. Uh, he did uncredited work on Return of the Jedi, but Probably the biggest question people would have about this movie and that are old farts like us and can remember the show. Yes, he also <laughs> handled Airwolf. So oh, <laughs> when, the Blue Thunder ripoff. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> which I think at this time was filming a TV movie like right around the same time this happened or right after or something like yeah. that, it, at least right before it went to series. Like, but we'll get all that. But so as you can imagine, when they were making Airwolf, he had done Blue Thunder or something so yeah they had somewhere in there it worked out for him and they were like hey can you do helicopter stunts and monty jordan said this is how we do it <laughs> i wrote that i'm really glad we notes. got a montel jordan uh, <laughs> I, wrote, I wrote that I joke thinking... in my notes as i kept writing monty jordan <laughs> <laughs> thank you because that was definitely in my mind <laughs> I, well th yeah i love when we can highlight the work of stunt stunt uh actors because stunt men and stunt women are kind of the unsung heroes of these action movies and they very rarely get any recognition. I can't believe that we're in the year of 2021 and there's still not a stunt category for like the like the Oscars. God. Uh, like as we're recording this, you guys will hear it in a couple of weeks I guess, but as we're recording this the Oscars are on this evening and it's it just really blows my mind that these guys have never been just acknowledged by by these awards organizations. It's yeah. really crazy the, because the guys actually guys are, like are risking their lives to make movies. literally putting their lives on the line to get the movies made and we can't even give them a fucking award. It drives me crazy, but so we'll we'll try to give them the recognition. We don't have quite as big of a uh, a reach as the Oscars, but we'll, we'll give them something. We're working on it. Yeah, we're we're getting there. So Blue Thunder was shot on location in Los Angeles in late 1981. But as I mentioned before, the LAPD didn't allow the film to make any references to them by name, which is why the police force in the film is just referred to a kind of a generic name of the Metropolitan Police. They couldn't use LAPD. Oh. They couldn't use the name of the Air Division. They're, it's called like the Astro something division. Uh, but most of the film's aerial sequences were filmed with real helicopters with these stuntmen that Gary is talking about. Uh, they used a, a modified aerospatial gazelle is the name of the helicopter that was stood in for the Blue Thunder. They actually had two of those uh, in the film that they purchased for about $190,000 a piece, flew them out to California, and then heavily modified them for the film. Mm. Uh, and I mean, they very heavily modified them. The alterations made them so heavy that the filmmakers had to get kind of creative for certain shots to make the helicopter seem faster and more agile on film than it really was because it actually moved kind of slow because I mean, it had like, it added a lot of weight to it and it had like one inch thick walls. And it was, it was very, a very heavy piece of equipment and they would do trick shots. They would do uh, sped up shots. And then, then like in one, well, it actually did this a lot, but the, in this one particular sequence, you know, the scene where Murphy like does the loopy loop at the end. Yeah. Rick, uh, Malcolm McDowell's character. That was a, radio controlled model helicopter 
uh, oh. which they used for several shots where it wasn't safe to do it with the real thing. Uh, like when the Arco Tower gets hit with a missile, the only way to safely do this towards the end of the movie, the only way to safely get the shot of the helicopter like flying away from the explosion was to use a model. They didn't want to fly a real helicopter that close to a falling tower that had just exploded. So, so they use, yeah, so they used RC helicopters in this a lot. They use RC, uh, F-16s as well, and they kept crashing. Oh, so, so a lot of the shots of the F-16s are composite shots. I was gonna say uh, it looked like fun. a lot of composite stuff. Or those are composite shots but, or something. But yeah, there's there's some footage in the behind the scenes documentary of the F-16 models just like nose diving into the ground. They were having trouble with those. <laughs> yeah, I mean they do a good job though. I mean with models when they're used to right, I mean it works. Like you you can you can it make does. it look like the real thing. It looks better than CG a lot of the time. So well because it's tangible you know right and they had originally used uh planned on using a a model building for that barbecue chicken restaurant that blows up you know the missile accidentally hits the barbecue restaurant yeah but then they were able the production was able to find an abandoned building in los angeles downtown uh which let them they were actually able to do the explosion at full scale because fire is one thing like when you're using models you can always tell it's a model because fire is going to be the size of of fire regardless right, fire right. and water and models you can always tell uh, so they used a real uh, it was an abandoned building they built a facade on it they rigged up you know the the van outside that flips they rigged with explosions and they used real that that great shot where it's it's really funny where just a bunch of barbecue chickens come flying down yeah they used real <laughs> chickens <laughs> yeah they used real chickens because it was cheaper because rubber chickens were john badham says that they were he's like yeah rubber chickens are like 10 bucks a pop i can, we can go down and get these whole roasted chickens for 250 a pop so we just bought like a thousand chickens <laughs> and <laughs> and then they they rigged this whole stunt they had these things in the air that were uh, like held all the chickens and at a certain point john badham like you know, during the explosion, he wo was waving a flag, which was their signal to open these things up and chickens just fly, just drop on the ground. And so you see these like stunt cars going through and sliding around the ground uh, yeah. in that scene because they're sliding on chicken grease. <laughs> <laughs> it's Oddly really enough, it's kind of sad and, and kind of interesting at the same time. But apparently the homeless population in that general area were, were like very excited about the filming of this scene. <laughs> yeah, they came up and they helped clean it up, yeah. picking up a bunch of chickens. Uh, it is kind of a waste of chicken. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> At least the homeless people got their chicken. I was yeah. about to say, it's like on one hand, it's kind of funny. And then on the other hand, you're like, these people just bought like a thousand chickens just to dump them on the ground. And there's homeless people that are just looking yeah. for chicken. You know? At least looking for something chicken. to eat. Yeah. But anyway, that's a bummer. Let's talk about something else. Well, let's talk about Malcolm McDowell a little bit more because I mentioned earlier how he, you know, he, he had this fear of flying. He did this thing Roy Scheider talks about where he puts his head between his legs. Well, they did shoot a lot of his, I mean, they did some stuff with rear projection, you know, uh, but they did a lot of scenes where they were in an actual helicopter, you know, and they, and they would have someone else flying uh, because on a lot of these helicopters, you can actually fly from both seats. So you, you'll see a shot where it's kind of at an angle where you'll see Malcolm McDowell or Roy Scheider, but you can't see the other seats because the actual pilot's in the other seat. Uh, now, Roy Scheider, by the way, he actually could fly. He was in the Air Force. And oh, wow. he could, he so he would actually, scenes where he got in the helicopter and like took it off or landed, mm -hmm. they would actually let him do that because he had the ability, but they wouldn't let him for probably insurance purposes, actually fly up in the air. Right. But Malcolm McDowell was the same thing. So he's in the air, another guy's flying, but they kept having to reshoot his scenes because he would look really scared in them. And after every take, or after most takes, he would, as soon as they called cut, he would puke everywhere. Like he, like he would just throw up. <laughs> yeah, wow. most of those cockpit scenes are like, like you said, just uh, like where they're flying at night and stuff. It's like rear projection like on yeah. a sound stage but yeah i had a quote from uh, roy scheider where he was saying when we first started to make the film the thought of malcolm mcdowell and myself flying around in copters wasn't really considered as much but as we began to process the shots we were so much better whenever we were in the copters so it really required 
or the shots were so much better whenever we were in the copter. So it really started to require that we both appeared in them, and we wound up doing most of the stunts ourselves. I mean, there was a stunt pilot aboard, and he was set back in the machine, so you couldn't see him, but he was piloting all of the stunts with us in the, in the buildings and through the aqu aqueducts. Everything you see out the window is what we saw, and it was pretty scary. Yeah. Uh, another scene that they talk about that I thought was uh, really fun, another stunt kind of thing they talk about was at the end when Murphy lands the helicopter down on the on the train track, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Obviously, they weren't going to do that with a real, you know, $200,000 helicopter. Uh, so they built a they built a replica out of wood and rigged it with like gasoline and explosions. And then they asked the train people, hey, can we run your train into this thing into this helicopter and they're like yeah sure let's do it <laughs> so that so they they put this thing on the tracks and they now it was going slower than it looks like in the movie they cranked up the camera so that it would look like it's going faster but yeah that's an actual train going into a full-size replica of one of the uh, of the blue thunder helicopter and when you see roy scheider walking away from it and it explodes and he kind of ducks down you know yeah uh, that's because the explosion was much bigger than they thought it was going to be and it it actually startled him but it's a great reaction yeah. uh because he still kind of keeps doing that cool guy walking away from yeah he's still stoic about it thing, but he's <laughs> but he does kind of jump a little bit which adds a bit of realism to it that you don't actually get from a lot of those cool guy walking away from an explosion scenes oh yeah yeah um, some of the other cool stuff with like sets I saw were like the Piper Technical Center, uh, which is the headquarters for the uh, not LAPD. Um, the Metropolitan the, Police. Yeah, the Metropolitan Police. Uh, this is before the built. This is the first time that it was used in a movie. It was before it was operational, but so they built their stuff like right on top of it. But it's an actual government building right now, and uh, but it but it's been used in a bunch of different movies like Beverly Hills Cop and Lethal Weapon Three and Speed oh. and like it's it's a con I don't know what it is about that building, but I just found that kind of just an interesting side note. But uh, also the city councilwoman, her house it's a uh, it's it's an exterior set like at Warner Brothers Ranch, but it's the same house that's used for like Roger Murtaugh's house at Lethal Weapon. So, oh yeah, really? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. wow. So the just, one that, the one that like ex the toilet explosion. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, well, another one of my favorite sets is the, I love the chase with, with uh, Kate through the drive-in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They had originally, they had originally shot that scene to be much longer. It was a much more of like a classic kind of action movie car chase. They even had a stunt where it was like up on its two wheels, like, which is a which was done in like a James Bond movie earlier, you know, and something ridiculous like that works in a James Bond movie, but in this, it turned out to be a little bit too ridiculous and too unbelievable that she would be able to do these crazy stunts. So they kind of shortened it to just the just the stuff in the uh, in the drive-in. And John Batham was shooting that scene. He was actually in the back seat with her as she was driving. It's scared to death because she's not a, a real stunt driver, uh, <laughs> but that. That was shot at an actual drive-in theater, uh, which is no longer there. I think a grocery store is there now. <laughs> but, uh, but that's a fun scene because I, I do like that they shortened it because she doesn't seem like she's a capable like getaway driver. It seems kind of clumsy, you know, which it should be because yeah. she's just a girl who got sucked into this situation, you know. Mm. There's a lot of really cool action sequences in this, like where they chop the police car in half and stuff with the gunfire. Yeah. Like that's awesome too. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, the helicopter at the beginning landing right on that building. Like there's some great stunts in this. There really are. I still wonder if the F-16 that he shoots down with Blue Thunder, where does that thing go? Because they never cover that. Does it land on a bunch of buildings or houses? <laughs> the or one something? that like just shoots off into the air? Yeah. <laughs> I thought about that too. Well, because the, the the thing with this movie, it does this, it does the G.I. Joe thing where every time something's about to crash, like somebody parachutes out or you see them climbing, a car gets, you know, flipped over and then you see people climbing out of it to show you that they're okay well you yeah. can't that's have the, roy scheider like murdering people basically but that's what he did in the original script <laughs> right right <laughs> the original script he just murdered people but yeah this def definitely does the gi joe thing where they show you that every everyone's okay and because gi <laughs> joe always did that like they would shoot a cobra jet the jet would explode but you'd see somebody jump pop out with a parachute every time just to show you that these cartoons were not murdering people <laughs> this movie does but yes i thought the same thing gary because th that's what happens in that scene the pilot uh ejects 
but then the the F-16 just goes flying off into the distance. I was like, that's going to land somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it could be on a very well-populated area. Yeah, it's true. It's funny you said that because it reminded me of like, uh, remember Toy Fair magazine? And they always had like the, you know, the the comics with the toys like acting out the yeah. things or whatever. Yeah. But there was one scene where like He-Man's with the G.I. Joes and like Cobra shows up and Cobra's running at them and they're like, let's go, Joe. And they all start shooting and the lasers are like flying in the air, like arching over everyone. And like He-Man like looks at uh, like the G.I. Joe guys and he like pushes their guns down a little bit and like shoots like a whole lot of cover <laughs> soldiers down and everybody stops and like the joes like look at he-man and they're like dude that is not how we play so obannon and jacoby were invited to the set as the writers but obannon didn't always like what he saw happening on set when he talks about batam he does not mince words because as we've learned about O'Bannon, he, he does not mince words. He yeah. said, quote, John Batham has very little film sense. He directs a $20 million movie like a TV episode. When you actually see him on set, you realize how lost he really is. <laughs> well. Yeah, not happy. He also describes one day where he was on set uh, and Roy Scheider forgot one of his lines and Batham's direction was, Take this with a grain of salt, because again, this is coming directly from Dan O'Bannon, the world's angriest man. But he says that Batam said, quote, it doesn't matter. It's only dialogue. Just say something and put the word shit in it. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I do have a feeling that he might be exaggerating here, but Scheider in his interviews, he does say that there was a lot of improvisation on set, especially in the dialogue between him and Daniel Stern, like when they're in the cockpit of the helicopter. A mm -hmm. lot of that was improv. Wow. Yeah. Dan O'Bannon not trying to make friends ever. He does not. He's never concerned with making friends. No. Does not suffer fools at all. No, not at all. No. no. Uh, for what it's worth, I saw they filmed for like 80 days and had like 450,000 feet of film by the end of it. Wow. So that just seems like a lot. So I found that interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Probably just from filming aerial scenes over and over again, too. Just like, well, uh, you're doing a lot of that uh, stuff from different angles and stuff, too. You have to when you're doing big stunts like that. Cause a lot of those scenes, like, like the one where they blew up the helicopter on the train track, you got one shot. Mm. They had one helicopter. They're like, take two would have to be eight weeks down the line so we can do another build another helicopter right. like we got it we got one so you have to shoot it from different angles which of course equals more film the blue thunder was released theatrically on may 13th 1983 it actually came in number one at the box office it's opening weekend it knocked flash dance out of the top spot uh, it would go on to gross 42 million dollars at the box office plus an additional 21 million dollars in video rentals very successful film uh, and the reviews were really kind as well uh, variety called it a quote Rip snorting live action cartoon, utterly implausible, but no less enjoyable for that. And the Washington Post said that, quote, Blue Thunder hovers just this side of trash and the other side of credibility, but it propels a willing audience into adrenaline heaven. Those those are amazing reviews. That's honestly. not bad. I, bet I would absolutely go see a movie described that way. <laughs> a and rip like snorting live action cartoon. Hell yeah, I'm going to see that. And Shiner's like, you can tell he's like into it. Uh, another quote I found from him was uh, talking about the movie. He saw something, you know, I mean, he's obviously hoping for more out of this. Uh, he said, I think it's a very important movie. It alerts people to the kind of ultra conservative or even fan, uh, fascistic tendencies of some law enforcement personnel. There are people who would like to make sure your life is very well run and near that you cooperate with the government and that they know at all times you are behaving as a good citizen. In other words, your personal freedom and your personal life is of great interest to them. Not really, but they're interested in making sure you're not doing anything wrong. You're also not free. You're not alive. You live in fear. You have no relationships with anyone that can mean anything because someone is always listening. So there's a sp spooky aspect to this film that I think is important. He hoped, he hoped it would do to helicopters what Jaws did to sharks. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the film got great reviews or really pretty good reviews upon release. Uh, but I am curious. Uh, I'm really curious about internet reviews on this one, Gary, because this is not like a cult classic. I wouldn't say this movie's almost kind of been forgotten to time. 
but uh, I, I imagine there are people who have come across it. It's on. I watched it on Amazon Prime, I think, so it's pretty easy to find. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what people who have come across it on the internet have had to say about it. Yeah, it's uh, interesting because uh, maybe because of the lack of popularity or whatever, that there's not as many reviews and very few one star reviews that I could find. So uh, I will say that that I don't know, it, maybe it's just the lack of popularity or maybe just people just think it's good enough that nobody decided they hated it enough to give it one star. But either way, I did find a few people, though, uh, where it certainly sounds like somebody needs a nap. <laughs> Let's see here. We got uh, <laughs> this. I've mixed something up because I'm gonna I'm gonna review that. I'm gonna read this review, and you'll see that I uh, mixed something up here. Uh, animated trash is what this review says. <laughs> In case you couldn't tell by the scantily clad, <laughs> ridiculously endowed sex object on the cover, I think that might be <laughs> from heavy metal. I was gonna yeah. say Roy Snyder isn't really wearing that much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I got a couple. Does he put on the uh, uh, the the Tara? I'm Does telling you, this Tara movie costumes? would not Slow be. Motion. <laughs> this movie would not be forgotten if there was an extended scene of Roy Scheider putting on that outfit. Wait, Daniel Stern, <laughs> Daniel Stern in the in the Tara uh, the Tara costume, and Roy Schneider just gets uh, Den's loincloth. Yeah, there nice you go. Room. Yeah, I like it. Uh, John D. Page says, lame action movie, but cool helicopter. At no time does this movie ever reach the point of being believable. And even for an action movie, at some point, it has to do that. The helicopter is very cool, but do they really think that if it was going to be used to keep everyday people in line, they would test it out in the open like this? Much less let a pilot that is known as a loose cannon be the one to test it? The other problem is that they go out of their way to keep the movie light and then add a very sick murder in for spice. Skip it. The uh, only other really interesting one I found was this one from Aaron Capen Banner, who says his review title is it's a helicopter. It's just a sentence. That's the <laughs> it's a helicopter. <laughs> John Badham directed this helicopter adventure yard that stars Roy Scheider as LA police officer and police pilot Frank Murphy, who is assigned a new partner played by Daniel Stern and a new assignment to test pilot a new stealth experimental helicopter to be used to combat civilian crime. But Frank becomes suspicious when the project manager turns out to be an old nemesis from his Vietnam War days, a Colonel Cochran, played by Malcolm McDowell, who does indeed have nefarious plans for the Blue Thunder. And Murphy becomes determined to not only expose the program, but destroy it. Had I known the beginning of this review was just a recap of the movie, I would have skipped that part. <laughs> it's an interesting premise and a good cast that are completely wasted in this cliche picture that becomes alarmingly ridiculous, right down to this preposterous showdown between Murphy and Cochran, which takes the viewer out of this picture altogether. One star. Wow. Yeah. Man, I don't agree with these people. I think there's some really good action scenes in this movie. Because I, I, some of the reviews I've read, like on Letterboxd and stuff, people talk about it like the action scenes are boring or whatever. But that that final fight between between uh, Scheider and McDowell, like that's a great action sequence. And there are a few yeah. other ones throughout the film that are really good, I think. Uh, I mean, it's not, I don't know if this is an action movie classic. You know, if I were coming up with like a top whatever action movies, this would not be super high on the list. But I think the action sequences are really good. And I think the story is intriguing. I would have liked to have seen Dan O'Bannon's original version of this. Uh, because I think it sounds more interesting to me. Like the idea of having sort of an anti-hero at the center. But the movie that we got, I think, is pretty damn good. There's a lot to like about it, I think. I mean, I was, I was, yeah, I, I was never bored. I was, I think I was engaged the entire time. Like, I thought that, like, a lot of the stuff was, was fun. Like, it was just a fun action flick. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have, like, a bunch of, like, outstanding things to say. It's not, like, you know, the best thing I've ever seen. But I will say, watching it, one thing I did 
uh, come to the conclusion on is that Roy Scheider doesn't give it a, a get enough credit as an actor because he really doesn't. He's he's very good, and there's there's scenes in this one that I I thought of Jaws on just because of there's scenes that, uh, for instance, th- there's there's the scene where you know Brody's talking to his son or whatever, and they're like imitating each other. Um, that gets a, a lot of props to Spielberg, but the scenes where Scheider in this movie is talking to the woman and her son, you know, like he's interacting with them. He's very lovable, like likable. Yeah. I don't know. Just some, somewhere Even in there. They, there's... they clearly have had some issues in their relationship or whatever, but he never comes across as being like a, like a jerk. Yeah. There's just something about him that just is able to play like a tough guy when he needs to. And then he's just got this, like you, you can't help but like him to me at least. Yeah. And so um, I do wish that the film had delved a little bit more into his PTSD. I mean, we get sure. a little bit of that. Yeah, and you, you, you see in the end how Malcolm McDowell's character plays into that. But I feel like that was probably, I feel like there was some stuff left on the cutting room floor or taken out of the original script when it was rewritten that went deeper into that stuff. It's funny you say that because I mean, that, that is stuff that hit me, but it was also like, at the end of the day, the movie that this became, like it or not, it felt like that might have been too deep for it, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah, like yeah. the Dan O'Bannon version of it. Uh, yeah, that that probably would have been something that would definitely should have been tackled. Um, but like in this movie, it just became like a fun 80s action movie. And so, yeah. like, you know, they didn't want anybody to be sad about how fucked up Roy Scheider is, I think. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Todd? What's Todd's take? Uh, you know, I, I, I really, I really do want to be positive about this one, but outside, I, it's, it's the the stunt work is amazing, and I don't think anybody can really dispute that. I think it's a good looking movie, but I feel it's a like, really good looking movie. The uh, cinematography yeah. is outstanding. Yeah, but the character development and plot are a little light and i really wish i really wish they had kind of gone full throttle on you know something a little bit more something a little deeper something a little more meaningful i'd almost like i feel feel like i feel like because they didn't i feel like this maybe didn't age well outside of like in in terms of the content like watching it the stunts are great and, and that's it doesn't fantastic. feel like very like specifically 80s in the way that a lot of movies can. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, but probably because the fashion, I mean, everyone's pretty much wearing like uniforms and stuff, so which isn't going to age as much. Yeah. The treatment of women is, uh, you know, I watched this and heavy metal both with my wife uh, who, <laughs> who deserves an award <laughs> having, <laughs> having stuck it through both of these movies. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it's, I don't know I, if I, if I have to choose thumbs up or thumbs down, I think I might go thumbs down. Just, I, I look, I, look, I want something a little bit, a little bit deeper, a little more meaningful. That's, yeah, that's I mean, but not everything has to be deep and meaningful. Nah, With that I said, know. I mean, that's not, that's not the movie they were setting out to make. Now that's right. the movie that Dan O'Bannon was setting out to make. Exactly. And I would, I would be willing, I, I would be excited if someone were to go back and remake this and use Dan O'Bannon's original script as yes. the basis, even though it would have to be updated. But I think that the themes of his original script, which we see a little bit of in the movie, but I think the themes of that, like the, the idea of the government using this technology to watch your everything and the idea of, Oh, the police not necessarily all being good guys. Right, uh, it's very relevant to 2021. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's something mm-hmm. that I think could make very much a, a really good movie if 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 somebody were to really like have the balls to do that. They were yeah. going for more Rambo three than Rambo one, though. Like when right. the studio got a hold yeah. of it. So. By the time they got a hold of it, that's exactly what they were doing. Now and, that, you know, uh, by the way, that that uh, cinematography you guys are talking about, that's John Alonzo. Uh, I yeah, mentioned that, and uh, he. Yeah, he did like Chinatown and uh, nice. Vanishing Point and cool. Star Trek Generations. 
Hey, uh, Todd. So there we yeah. go. Nice. Oh, nice. They're working with Malcolm <laughs> McDowell again, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, John Alonzo is a, a really great um, cinematographer. He's a Mexican uh, born uh, cinematographer. And he he's, he's won a lot of awards. I think he did Scarface too. That may be uh, right. as well for Brian De Palma. Yeah, if, if I remember correctly. But yes, he is. He's a legendary uh cinematographer who unfortunately died uh fairly young and i mean in, in his mid 60s in uh, like the early 2000s or so but yes uh the cinematography is outstanding i i absolutely agree and you know blue blue thunder doesn't have it's not like a cult classic i do think it deserves more of a following than it does it's weird that it's not more remembered now because it was kind of a big deal at the time. I mean, like we said, it knocked Flashdance out of the number one spot. It made a lot of money. It had good reviews. And it was a big enough hit to inspire a television series uh, after its release, also called Blue Thunder. It aired for 11 episodes in 1984 before being canceled due to low ratings. The TV series starred... Uh, it's a the character's a different name. It's not Frank Murphy. It's Frank something else, but it's basically the same character. Uh, but James Ferentino, the sheriff from Dead and Buried, was oh. the main character in the Blue Thunder uh, series, nice. and uh, he was so he was the policeman and the pilot of the helicopter. And his sidekick, his partner, was Dana Carvey, <laughs> who uses the helicopter blades to chop broccoli. <laughs> uh... This would have been. I mean, 1984, that would have been before his stint on SNL, right? I believe so. Like right, right before, now. probably? Yeah. Because yeah. I saw that and picture. That, he looks like a kid. Yeah, yeah. And if that's not weird enough, the Blue Thunder's ground crew was played by former football players Bubba Smith and Dick Butkus. <laughs> well, Bubba Smith is high tower in the Police Academy movies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a big dude. <laughs> uh, so strange and there was also a blue thunder video game that was released much later in 1987 it was released on the action max game system you guys remember action max no uh I no sure, i sure <laughs> didn't either uh so i looked into it and it's a very short-lived uh game console that used vhs tapes for games so the, the Blue Thunder, yeah, really weird. Uh, and you actually had to hook your own VCR to the console. It didn't have the ability to play tapes, which probably did not help sales. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, you can buy this, but you've also got to have your own fucking VCR. <laughs> but, uh, hey. but, so, but by doing that, you could, it would be able to use, utilize actual clips from the movie on, you know, as part of the game. So nice. as very, that was very strange. I'm that actually kind strange. of intrigued about how the hell that even works. Like, yeah. what, what does it do? Is it like fast forwarding and rewinding to scenes from the movie? Like, what do you have? Do, do you have to rewind it every time you're done playing? Yeah, that's what I'm like. What, what is this thing doing? <laughs> I don't that's, understand it. I, I really, I would love to get a hold of one. That's insane. Just to like, just to like try it out. Now, I yeah. will say, too, we talked about this a little bit up top, I think before we even hit record, but one weird thing about Blue Thunder, you talk about a cult following. There's a weird cult like uh, presence on the internet for this movie, which is really strange. It's like cult of cult presence on the internet because yeah. there are sites you can find like Blue Thunder online. And uh, yes, a lot, a lot of the... Um like interviews that we found like the star log stuff I, you know with with dan o'bannon and even with roy scheider like that was all found on yeah blue thunder online i think is what it's called and then which there's, hasn't been updated since 2009 but they're still paying to host it so somebody out there created an, an entire website dedicated to blue thunder and then and, gary you found another one right yeah the blue thunder helicopter.com which has and, been more recently updated yeah and it's just a blue thunder fan blog so shout out to both of those guys running those for helping us with some material on this episode. Yeah. Uh, Cause and it, very strange. So yeah, it may not have a big cult following, but at least a couple people out there care enough to create entire websites dedicated to this movie. You know, you know, Justin's going to dig into there to find pictures of these like freaking uh, model kits and everything. I'm looking at right now on blue thunder helicopter.com at the uh, cover the Japanese model kit. No, I'm, right now I'm looking at the DVD cover for uh, the complete series, Blue Thunder, starring James Ferentino. It's just got the photos <laughs> oh, on the back and stuff. Nice. It's, it yeah. is real weird. Uh, I don't. 
that's so odd that this exists. It's the the site and the DVD set for the TV series. But, hey, somebody <laughs> out there wants it, I guess. There was also uh, talk I found, uh, according to the Hollywood Reporter, but this was in like 2015. So who knows where this is going to go? But there was a remake in the works at oh, one yeah? point. It was written by Craig Kyle, who's a former Marvel Studios executive and uh he was he, he worked on like i know thor and thor ragnarok like he had he had worked on those but uh the people that did this is not going to sound promising but uh it was like dana brunetti who was uh executive producer on 50 shades of gray was working on it with him and uh um yeah anyway i don't know obviously it's 2021 now and that's still not gone anywhere so we'll see yeah. but that was apparently there was talk about it people haven't forgotten it existed yeah interesting but i did want to mention that one of the sweet things i thought of or found from this movie is that although they were bitter enemies in the film roy scheider and malcolm mcdowell met each other uh filming blue thunder and became the best of friends and uh it lasted Roy Scheider's entire life like that they were best friends with each other and uh oh, it, th so there's like some sweet stuff you can find about like it broke that. Malcolm McDowell when Roy Scheider passed away and mm. he uh took care of the family and stuff like that like oh man all that stuff but anyway I realize that that's really cool yeah. uh, so do you guys have any any further viewing any other movies that you would you would yes. pair with this yes because yeah, I, I, I didn't really I don't really have anything for this one but I've been trying to put some more thought other into than those. I, I just kept thinking of like Knight Rider and other <laughs> like other vehicle shows, you know, well, or, I was, or, but I, I was think thinking of like more movies. of, well, I was thinking more of because this, you know, really takes place on the canvas of Los Angeles. I thought, you know, and this is in the eighties. So if you're looking for a double or maybe even a triple header, maybe pairing this with speed. I okay. think would also be fun. Uh, also, uh, Italian Job, the the remake of the Italian Job, which also yeah. takes place in Los Angeles and showcases the city. I think if, I think the, I think both of those are really fun and would make for a really fun evening of viewing. All right, you lunatics. Well, I feel like this is the second time somehow this movie has come up on this show, and I don't know how or why that would happen. Except this movie clearly is ripping off Blue Thunder, but Stealth from 2005 oh, yeah. would be one to mention with uh <laughs> with jamie fox and jessica beale and josh lucas josh Remember lucas him? i was like and, who's the dude in that well uh, i feel like it came up the time before it came up i swear to god it's come up again in this series and todd we had that exact same conversation we were like we were both like who the fuck was that white guy yeah. That was in it. Yeah, I can't even remember who was the generic white dude they used. It was the, it, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was Josh Lucas, Josh Lucas. with Jessica yeah. Biel and Jamie Foxx. But yeah, and it's about they have the fourth stealth machine that's like extra super equipped, but it's AI enabled, and it goes rogue, and so then they have to like battle with it. But anyway, it feels a lot of the plot points in this seem kind of like that movie mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. but, okay anyway. all right i didn't really i don't really have any I, I mean i i guess that i would kind of i kind of like the idea of doing director double feature so i think doing war games would be really cool just to see like two mm -hmm. movies that john batham did back to back in the same year and kind of compare and contrast them mm -hmm. although yeah. i i've not seen war games in many years so I, I i can't really speak to that off the top of my head uh but i know that it's a favorite of a lot of people our age Oh yeah, yeah. Old that's folks. not a bad idea at all. But yeah, this this movie's fun. I mean, if you're just looking for like the '80s vibe, I mean, the score and everything too is is very like synth heavy and like got a it's a it's a it's just a fun. I don't know '80s movie. There's nothing like super super special about it. And clearly, what Dan O'Bannon, you know, like we said, had intended was was left on the cutting room floor. Not even didn't even make it to the cutting room floor, I guess, but uh you know anyway next week he'll get his chance that's right so o'bannon at this point in his career was becoming frustrated by the whole process of filmmaking he didn't seem to ever get to see his true vision come to life on screen uh, with the scripts constantly going through other screenwriters other directors other entities who changed them from his original intent this was getting frustrating for him after the release of blue thunder he actually said quote it's a bad business, Hollywood. 
I'm just about fed up. If I can't get something to direct soon, I'm going to get out of this business and be a novelist or something. But luckily for his next film, Dan O'Bannon would finally get to be the guy calling all the shots nice. next week on the show. One of my, literally one of my favorite movies of all time. We're going to discuss <laughs> Dan O'Bannon's directorial debut, Return of the Living Dead. Ooh. So I'm excited for that. Have you ever seen Return of the Living Dead, Todd? I have. It's been a while, okay. but I okay. have seen it. I really enjoy it. <laughs> so, a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, good. that's going to be fun right. to go into it with our new style of thing. I don't know. Maybe is that the first one we've like read? No, like Lethal Weapon we've redone. Yeah, we've uh, redone it in Night of the Living Dead. Our very first episode was a remake. Oh, uh, yeah. Re our re-record, but yes. We're, we're yeah. doing remakes of our old shit. Uh, <laughs> so where can you guys be found on the internet? I am at This Is Gary Horde on all of the things. I have a wrestling show called At TIPW Show. That's not what it's called. It's called This Is Pro Wrestling, but it is At TIPW Show on all the things. And uh, that's me. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and... And I am at Mr. Todd A. Davis on all the socials. You can find my Star Trek podcast, the Computer Resume podcast, uh, on Apple and Spotify and Amazon. And you can just find the places it on you find podcasts, media. wherever you're the, listening. Yeah, to the this places you podcast right now, you yeah, can find Todd's yeah, fucking podcast. You can find it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, you can reach out to the show uh, at Computer Resume on all the socials. And I am at Justin underscore Bishop. My only podcast is Cinema Shock, which you can find at Cinema underscore Shock. Twitter, Instagram, we're on Facebook. Uh, head to cinemashock.net to find all of our old episodes, uh, find links to buy our merch, uh, find links to all of our socials, everything. It's the, everything you need to know about this podcast is on cinemashock.net, including links to where you can uh, stream upcoming movies that we're going to be talking about, not just next week's movie, but upcoming weeks as well. I usually put about the next four weeks or so on there so uh yeah give us a give us a like on facebook rate review on apple share us with all of your friends and until next week may the wings of liberty never lose a feather be excellent to each other johnny has the keys and with blue thunder we'll find them Thank, uh, yeah good job todd uh, <laughs> I, I i think i hurt myself reaching for that one <laughs> yeah i think you did i think yeah. that you should take your wife's uh, advice and change of the egg shower <laughs> <laughs>when you're walking on eggs they say eggs oh yeah they do say why, eggs why when you're walking you on say egg shells that's a good question i don't know who walks on eggs who walks on eggshells that's true <laughs> who but hops johnny, on any of it but johnny has the keys so he do, he, but the thing he doesn't that's the whole <laughs> thing <laughs>